you mentioned altruism before. Do you agree that advocating for Bitcoin is pure altruism or love? I think that um, you come to Bitcoin who you are. Mm. And if you're naturally altruistic, you would see it in those terms. And that's how you approach it. If you're naturally greedy, you come to it from those terms. I, I just wrote something of, for Bitcoin magazine and talking about how Bitcoin is a, a funhouse mirror. And some people look at it and it, the reflection is that they're bigger. Their ego is bigger than normal size. And those people tend to flame out. Mm. Like, for example, a Roger Ver or a Craig Wright. You know, these two were very early into Bitcoin. So why did they crash and burn? It's because the magic mirror of Bitcoin, the funhouse mirror, reflected back on who they are, their true characters, which made them think that they were bigger than Bitcoin, that they knew better than Satoshi. And it was an exaggeration of who they were. And then that was kind of their downfall. Yeah. If you look at somebody like an Andreas Antonopoulos or a Michael Saylor, they looked into the Bitcoin magic mirror, the funhouse mirror, and it made them look smaller. And they immediately became more humble. Yes. They were humbled by it. Yes. And they were like, you know what? This is actually bigger than me. And I'm going to devote a lot of time to in the service of this thing, because this is a, an enormously important thing. And they, they were humbled by it. Mm. So um, it depends on who you are to begin with. It, it will determine how you interact with Bitcoin. And so it's a way, perhaps, to get back to the divine intervention where a divine entity is weeding out the bad actors. So it's like Superman. He can't handle kryptonite. Yeah. Right? Um, if you're a bad actor and your genes are not necessarily the best to survive into another generation, you will look at Bitcoin and it will destroy you, like uh, looking into Medusa. Mm. And if you're of a different character, you look into Bitcoin and it ennobles you. And then you continue. But I think there's a great, I mean, it's, again, I mean, it's hard to escape the biblical reference, but there's that day of judgment that comes, you know, and they separate those who believe and those who don't believe. And yeah. Bitcoin is, you know, again, using... <laughs> stretching a bit here to bring in more Bible stuff, but it does have a bit of a day of judgment. I mean, either you get with Bitcoin's what it's trying to do here, or you don't, but, um, you know, it's your choice. And, uh, I know where I'm placing my bets, you know, that's for me. Well, you are free to do as you would, you would like to do. Yeah. I mentioned this uh, before. It's 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 kind of like the the hard choices, easy life, easy choices, hard life. Like when you get to that judgment point, and you understand what you are judging about, there's only one decision you can really make that would benefit you, right? Because if you consciously go against it, you will have a hard life in the matrix. I always think about the matrix when the guy says, you know, I still want to eat the steak, like that that example, when he betrays like the group around Neo. Um, but I think it, it is this. It, it's actually one of these big, um, how do you say, like mechanisms that are at work all the time, right? If there's something that you have to decide something about, something that might be negative, you can think about it like, oh, that's so negative. I'm not going to decide about it. I'm just going to stick with it, right? But then it also sticks with you, all the negative stuff, when or when something is scary that you first have to endure before you can reap the reward, right? And when you look into the mirror, and if you don't like the image that you see, you can be like, okay, I'm not going to fight that because that's too scary, right? I'm just going to follow this and be like that. But that, that is when you see that, you know, you're, you're, you, you made an easy choice, but your life get, gets harder because you're fighting something that, um, yeah, you should not follow in that sense. The path narrows, right? Yeah. Or, um, you know, I read a C.S. Lewis quote just recently. Humility is not about thinking less of yourself. Humility is about thinking of yourself less. Yeah. <laughs> and I think okay. that 
is an important lesson in sobriety and in Bitcoin mm. and, and spiritual matters that you need to get out of yourself and think about other folks. And Bitcoin helps millions and billions of people who have no access to banking, have no access to making transactions, have no access to um, kind of uh, enjoying the benefits that the people who do have access can enjoy. And Bitcoin, the barrier to entry for that is very, very small and getting smaller all the time. And that brings about this global change in, in, in consciousness. And that's just changes your thought, thoughts, you know, that the thoughts that you, even the thoughts that you speak to yourself, you know, most mm -hmm. of the thoughts and the things that you hear are things that you're saying to yourself. So yeah. it's important that when you're talking to yourself, which is by far the most, the, the, the person who you hear more than any other are positive, good thoughts. Yeah. When you start to talk to yourself negatively, you know, you're already primed. Well, you're not being, actually talking. You're listening, right? You're, you're being picked off by the fiat money devil. Yeah. You know, who well, says, that, this is what, what helped me a lot is, um, I don't know if you know the book Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. No. He, he starts with, uh, if you hear the, if you're listening to the voice in your head, who's talking? That's a great start, you know. And and when you say you're talking to yourself, yes, something is talking to yourself, right? And and you are listening to that, but you are not the person uh, that is talking. And actually, while you were talking, I was thinking, when was the last time I talked negatively to myself? And I think it's a very long time ago, actually. Like, you know how how it was in the past, maybe. But yeah, well, this is the just... cycle of uh, alcoholism and drug addiction. Is that you know, there's a saying that the man takes a drink, a drink takes a drink, and then the drink takes the man. Right? Mm -hmm. It's just this progression of of the alcohol, the devil, essentially telling you what to do. Right? Yeah. That's the predominant voice in your head: is you need to drink more, you need to yeah. take more drugs. And the same thing with fiat money. Fiat money is telling you you need to go buy something that's going to Stuff. immediately yeah. become worthless it's going to yeah. end up in a landfill in in six yeah. months but you need to buy it right now because that's that that's the what's happening in your in your head because the fiat money addiction yes is working in your mind You're, you've become a fiat money addict and this is by far the most prevalent i mean look at washington dc talk about corruption you know, there's there's these uh, Congress people and senators in Washington D.C. who are making maybe one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, who are making twenty, thirty, forty million dollars a year trading the stock market. Now that is and people let them. That's clearly uh, legalized the, um, racketeering and inside information and to completely killing society. I mean, this is, mm. but it's it's not even given a second thought. That's how far. Yeah. Yes. Along we are yes. in the in the collapse of this empire of fiat money and debt. Hundred percent. That's that's what I also thought about when I said that before. This is how far we are, right? Like <laughs> it is so in your face, and people still they're like, "Yeah, I cannot do anything about it." But th but that is the thing, right? When you said the, the the drink takes a drink, and the drink takes the man. I thought, you know, you are not your you are not your thoughts, you are not your drink, you know, you are not your money. And I think once you understand you are not your money, like uh, you don't have to to follow this thing that is forced upon you. This was one of the moments that was a big click for me. I was just like, ah, so there's this system where I saved wealth, you know, a product of my or the rewards of my productivity. I don't like this system. I don't understand it. I'm manipulated. I'm outsourcing all these responsibilities. And then there's this other system that I can fully verify myself where everyone is basically forced to follow the rules or else they cannot benefit from this. I'm just going to go here. And then I just moved, right? Like it's, it's literally the meme you're selling your fiat money. It's, it's you're relieving yourself from, from the grip of that too. 
Yeah. You know, to get back to an earlier question about altruism, I think the Bitcoin standard allows for altruism to grow more representational in society than it is right now. Yeah. And altruism is a, is a negotiating technique, just like any other negotiating technique. It's not purely innocent, right? Mm -hmm. Altruism is a, another way that you approach an interaction and because you have a goal in that interaction. And, yeah. but it's a way that, has a lot of mutual benefits unlike let's say in bitcoin yeah yeah and the bitcoin fits the bill but whereas yeah. other forms of negotiating and interaction like violence is uh clearly destructive right and i say that bitcoin demonetizes violence because if it's unconfiscatable and uncensorable then no no amount of violence can get you get my bitcoin so yeah. you have to come at me with something else other than violence maybe it's altruism yeah. So altruism becomes a skill that's, you know, learned more as a way to negotiate and get what you want in life instead of violence. You know, violence is demonetized. Love, peace, altruism, these are monetized. These are, these are brought to the fore so that the, the complexion of society changes fundamentally, robustly. It's a very, very different. And we see it in El Salvador. I mean, El Salvador, I think, because since Bitcoin is legal tender, it doesn't really matter what percentage of the population is using Bitcoin on a day-to-day -day basis. The fact that the entire population is aware of Bitcoin, is thinking about Bitcoin, and sees the president, who is clearly an enlightened leader, it changes the mood of the entire country. People come here saying, you know, they love it here because it's so positive and upbeat. And where they come from, typically, is, you know, down. There's a big downer. Things are falling apart. And, yeah. and this is part of the transformation that we're seeing here. And Bitcoin is a very big part of that. Yeah. I just had a question that I, that I, that I lost, but I, I loved what you said about, um, oh yeah, so, sorry, the altruism, like it's zero sum game versus mutually beneficial game, right? And the ultimate example of zero sum game is I shoot you and I kill you, right? And I win and, and you lose. And I would agree that the altruism is in Bitcoin is, yeah, yes, to convince or at least show other people what Bitcoin could mean for them so that when they join, we both benefit. It's not me benefiting from that person joining. They are benefiting from me being in it and I'm benefiting, benefiting from them joining it and maybe adding value in you know, whatever way they, they would do it. So. And and also like it's clearly not a Ponzi. I heard you say, you know, uh, I love this. You know, we don't want you to buy it. You know, like all the all the maximalists say, like please don't, don't buy it because then there's less uh, for me. You know, so I, I I think that that was a great argument for why Bitcoin is not a Ponzi. But I right. wanted to ask you, toxic maximalism yeah. is kind of. You never find in a Ponzi scheme. Ponzi schemes are always by very good salespeople, slick people with a great patter, a great pitch, and <laughs> get into my Ponzi scheme. But more, you know, fundamentally would be that in a Ponzi scheme, by definition, there's an unlimited number of unbacked claims. Mm -hmm. As the Ponzi scheme grows, the number of claims grows with the Ponzi. That's what a Ponzi scheme is, right? So Charles Ponzi, who introduced this idea of selling these rare stamps to people who were getting a return based on new people coming in to buy these rare stamps, that was a, a Ponzi scheme or a pyramid scheme based on an ever increasing number of claims on that on those supposedly rare stamps, and eventually it collapses as they all do. So yeah. with Bitcoin, it's absolutely scarce. So it, by definition, an anti-Ponzi scheme. It's the complete opposite of a Ponzi scheme. People confuse. But people say that, well, you're only buying it because it's going higher, and that's a Ponzi scheme. But that's that's wrong. That's not what a Ponzi scheme is. No. Um, it's, 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 they're mixing metaphors here. I mean, people do buy it because it's going higher because they're protecting themselves against the fiat money that's losing purchasing power. Yes. You know, so you should, if you said, oh, you're just buying it because fiat money loses, is losing its purchasing power. Okay, and that's the exact same statement as saying you're only buying it because it's going higher. Those two statements are identical. But for mm -hmm. some reason, people choose to say the one where it's only going higher, and they never use or very rarely say it's because fiat money is mathematically guaranteed to lose its purchasing power. Right? That's 
why people buy Bitcoin, whether they see it in that way or not. That's ultimately what is going on. 